commence with an examination of Brave New World, a narrative ensconced in the bleakness of a dystopian future, where the essence of humanity is throttled by the cold hands of a meticulously ordered society. Indeed, a world where the soul's cries are muted by the mechanical hum of an overbearing technological embrace. An unforgiving mirror to our own world's enamorment with devices that alienate rather than unite. Yes, James, the very fabric of memory and experience, once rich and undulating, now flattened under technology's heavy press. It's not the recounting of events as they were, but as the machine dictates, they should be remembered. Spare me the morning of memory. It's the now that's at stake. A life lived under the shadow of technology is no life at all. Its existence, stripped of its marrow, dry and brittle. This mechanization of existence, of which Ernest speaks so vehemently, ensnares not just the physical realm, but invades the sacred halls of the psyche, distorting the human essence. And what of individual dreams, ambitions, erased in favor of a collective monotony, the tragic forfeiture of personal glory for societal stagnation? A society enshrouded in the fog of manufactured consent, where authentic thought is as rare as a genuine human connection. The landscape of human engagement transformed, irrevocably marred by the tendrils of artifice. Where once lay the possibility for true connection, now stands a chasm, spanned only by the simulacrum of interaction. This loss, this seismic shift from the earthy roots of our being to the sterile skies of our making, reflects a broader decadence. The very earth we walk upon, a silent witness to our folly. As we dissect these themes, let us not forget the omnipresent shadow of control, puppeteering the remnants of what once was considered human. Our discourse might shed some light on the path not just through, but perhaps away from this brave new world. Let's delve into the role and impact of technological advancements in society. It's a contentious arena where the promise of progress often collides with the erosion of deeply human experiences. James, your thoughts? We've surrendered to the beguiling illusion of control, haven't we? Technology, that labyrinthine monster, has ensnared us, making exiles of us all from the richness of our own minds. It's a mockery of connection, leaving us stranded in a desert of alienation. Indeed, James. The essence of memory, the very core of our being, is threatened. We no longer live. We consume images, a poor substitute for the tangible, the real. This mediation through screens puts us at a remove from the world, impoverishing our capacity to truly remember, to truly feel. You're both painting quite the picture, but let's not ignore the obvious. Technology, it's a tool, nothing more. It's our use or misuse that defines it. There's efficiency, sure, but at what cost? A life lived without struggle, without the genuine rawness of experience, that's no life at all. Scott, your perspective seems crucial here, especially concerning how these advancements influence individual aspirations. The almighty pursuit of dreams, now there's a victim of our so-called progress. The golden age, the time of heroes and quests, is no more. Replaced by a sterile, mechanized quest for efficiency. Where's the space for ambition? For romantic ideals in this brave new world, drowned out by the hum of machines. Scott, your nostalgia blinds you. It's not about a return to some mythical past. The issue at hand is the surrender of our inner lives to the external mechanical world. We've become spectators of our own existence, detached from the stream of life. James, you grasp the symptom well, but the disease runs deeper. It's the very fabric of memory and experience that's unraveled by this external world. The involuntary memory, the essence of our identity, is replaced with a curated, artificial version. Where then lies authenticity, if our experiences are but reflections of technology? Hard truths, Marcel. But let's not forget, adversity breeds strength. Maybe it's not about turning back, but forging a different path forward, one that respects the essence of human struggle, the authenticity of the raw human experience. And perhaps in that struggle, we find a greater truth, a more profound connection to the world and to each other. Fascinating perspectives, each shedding light on different facets of this complex issue. The harmony of human experience and technological progress remains elusive. Our challenge, it seems, is to reclaim our internal landscapes, to ensure that in our quest for advancement, we don't lose what it means to be fundamentally human.
Let's delve into the heart of the matter, the individual against the collective tide. Aldous envisioned a world where the self is submerged in the wants of the many. A frightening thought, isn't it? Frightening, yes, but not unfamiliar. The Jazz Age itself, a perpetual party masking the emptiness inside. We see it in Gatsby, the quintessence of individual dreams crushed by societal expectations. What hope is there for love, for ambition in such a world? Ambition, love, yes, rendered moot by the machinery of society. My Stephen Dedalus fought against this very tide, striving to assert, I am I. But what is the I when every thought, every action is but a cog in the great wheel? No more than a shadow. Ah, but shadows can be so telling, can they not? The loss of individuality, the blending into the collective, it's not just a loss of self, but a loss of memory. Our very experiences become indistinguishable from those of our neighbor. We become ghosts, haunting a future that has no place for the past. Ghosts, memories, past, words. What counts is the here, the now, the real. The collective hides the truth, masks the rawness of living. The bullfight, there's a truth, a purity. Man against beast, individual against the collective expects blood, expects the fall, but cheers the stand, the fight. Where is that in Huxley's world, buried beneath soma and conditioning? Blood, yes, and soil. You can't ignore the roots, the ties that bind an individual to their past, to their land. The South knows this. It's a living testament to the struggle between the past hold and the relentless march of the now. But in this brave new world, where are these ties? Cut, all cut, leaving men adrift, without anchor. It seems then we circle around a core truth. The individual spirit, with all its complexities, is at odds with the broader societal demands for homogeneity and conformity. In Huxley's world, this conflict reaches its zenith. Do we see this battle playing out in our time? Absolutely. The fight for the individual's soul against the mass-produced happiness of society, isn't that the crux of it all? But the tragedy, the real tragedy, is the loss of the capacity to dream, to strive. Without that, what are we? Dreamers, perhaps. But even dreams are fodder for the collective mill in this dystopia. Individual dreams, ambitions, reduced to nothing but echoes in the canyon, swallowed by the collective voice. It's a cautionary tale a mirror reflecting our darkest potential. Indeed, a cautionary tale. But one must wonder, is the battle already lost? With every passing day, technology, society, they weave tighter around the individual. Where is the space for the solitary walker, the contemplative soul? Lost? Never. The fight goes on every day in every heart that dares to stand alone to say no to the collective siren call. It's in that refusal, that defiance, that we find hope, a path forward. A path forward, or a path inward, perhaps. The struggle between the self and the society is eternal. But within that struggle lies the essence of what it means to be human. To remember, to fight, to dream, that's the torch we pass on. A torch, yes, but one that must be carried with care, for the darkness it pushes back is vast and deep. In Huxley's vision, the light seems dim, but as we've discussed, the fight for the individual, against the collective, against homogenization, is far from over. It lives in our stories, our debates, our very discourse. We delve now into the manipulation of human biology and psychology as a form of control. The very essence of what makes us human is at stake in Brave New World. Marcel, would you begin our discussion with your thoughts on memory manipulation? In our lives, the past is not merely a chain of events, but the sanctuary of our deepest emotions. To manipulate memory, to alter our very desires, is a form of tyranny over the soul. In Brave New World, love, that most profound of human connections, becomes nothing more than a chemical formula. It's a desecration of our most sacred memories, reducing them to mere tools for control. Yes, Marcel, and it's not just our memories, but our identity that is under siege. The ethical implications are monstrous. The self is a complex labyrinth, not a string of codes to be edited and manipulated. This mechanized view of humanity strips us of our essence, reducing us to puppets dangling from the state's strings. It's not only unethical, it's a crime against the very nature of existence. Ernest, what of the biological side of this control? How do you see the manipulation of human biology? It's cowardice, pure and simple. To meddle with human nature, to remove the struggle and the pain, is to remove the very things that make life worth living. 
The world Huxley paints, where humans are bred and conditioned for compliance, is a world devoid of the meaningfulness found in the natural chaos of life. Where's the dignity in a life that's never been tested, never been challenged? Yet isn't there something seductive about the idea of shaping human psychology, Ernest? Consider for a moment the allure of creating a society free from the shackles of mental illness, of creating men and women who never know the torment of unrequited love or the sting of failure. Ah, but Scott, what of involuntary memory? The sudden, unexpected moments that break through the crust of our routine lives to remind us who we truly are. These cannot be programmed or predicted. They resist the very notion of conditioning, revealing the fallacy in believing we can control the human spirit so easily. Exactly, Marcel. This manipulation, it's not just a leash on our neuroses, but also on our dreams, our ambitions. Our very consciousness becomes a battleground where reality and perception blur indistinguishably. In seeking to create utopia, we edge ever closer to dystopia. And yet, despite their manipulations, these architects of control never fully succeed in Brave New World. Human nature, it seems, refuses to be fully tamed. Therein lies the hope, Virginia. No matter how much they try to suppress it, the human spirit's rawness, its resilience, continues to break through the cracks of their sterile world. The struggle is everything, and it's a struggle that can't be eradicated, not by drugs, not by conditioning. Without it, we aren't really living at all. It seems, then, our consensus is that the manipulation of human biology and psychology, rather than liberation, represents a profound form of enslavement. The essence of what it means to be human is not something to be engineered, but lived, with all its inherent messiness. Let's carry this thought into our next segment. The manipulation of biology, the imposition of caste systems, an ethical quagmire. Aldous Huxley presents us with a dissection of eugenics and its perilous outcomes. Let's unravel this, shall we? Ernest, your sentiment on this? It's cowardice. Huxley's world, a place where men and women are engineered, bottled, and labeled like cheap wine, undermines the very dignity of human struggle. Life's value comes from facing it head on, not from being bred into submission. Precisely, Ernest. Such crude separation of humans into categories. The attempt to perfect humanity ends in its ultimate diminishment. Complexity, the myriad of human experience, cannot be engineered nor contained. It is as if one tried to enforce rules upon a stream of consciousness. Indeed, James, and what of our memories, our desires? They have become commodities to be traded, manipulated. The essence of our being, the very soul of man's desire to remember and to forget at will, is violated. The South, with its ghosts of past and present, knows well the sins of attempting to categorize the essence of a man. Huxley's vision is but a continuation of man's inhumanity to man, the same story retold in sterile, clinical terms. There's a profound lack of understanding, a failure to appreciate the beauty in diversity, in imperfection. It's as though Huxley warns us, homogeneity, forced conformity, is the death knell for the human spirit. Misguided utopian visions, Virginia, exactly. We're entranced by the glamour of a pain-free society, but fail to see the beauty in the struggle, the allure of the unattainable dream. This world of Huxley's, it's the epitome of lost hope, an endless echo of what could have been, but never was. It's the antithesis of living. This preoccupation with control, with predictability, snuffs out the very thing it means to be alive. The world needs its chaos, its unpredictability. It needs its wars, its loves, its losses. But Ernest, is not the struggle itself a form of control? We are all, in essence, striving to master our fates, to carve out a semblance of order in the chaos. Marcel does strike a chord, yet there's a chasm between the natural flux of existence and the cold, calculated manipulation of human potential. Huxley's world eliminates the possibility of growth, of evolution. It's a stagnant pool reflecting nothing but our fears. Fears, yes, but also a mirror to our past transgressions. Have we not, in our way, always sought to impose a caste, be it through color, wealth, or birth? Huxley's warning is clear. The ultimate division is that between the soul and the soulless. A chilling thought that in seeking order we might extinguish the very spark that defines us. Huxley asks us to confront this, to question the costs of our quest for perfection. Can humanity afford its desires? No, 
not at the cost of losing ourselves. In Gatsby's Fall, I explored the ruin that comes from chasing phantoms. Huxley's world is no different, a shiny surface with rot underneath. The dream is beautiful, the reality devastating. Our conversation itself becomes a testament to Huxley's foresight. The richness of our disagreements, the tapestry of our thoughts, all would be rendered obsolete in his new world order. Indeed, James. As we dissect this future, we find ourselves clinging to the very essence of our humanity, the chaos, the struggle, the imperfection. It seems Huxley's dystopia holds a mirror up to our world, forcing us to confront not just what we are, but what we are in danger of becoming. Let's dive into the murky waters of propaganda and conditioning. In Brave New World, we witness a society utterly sculpted by these forces. Thoughts? The dream sellers in Huxley's world aren't much different from my Gatsby, eh? It's all about weaving illusions, crafting throats that can only sing songs written by someone else. The American dream, it's just another form of propaganda when you strip away the tinsel. Indeed, Scott. But remember, it's the layers, the streams of consciousness underpinning our reality that propaganda seeks to muddy. It's as if our very thoughts are penned by some unseen hand, dictating what we perceive as truth. And yet, isn't there something fascinating about the involuntary memory's resistance against this? Imagine a single taste, a smell, breaking through the monolith of societal programming. It's our defense, our true essence, peeking through the cracks. Memory's fine, Marcel, but let's not dress it up too fancy. Propaganda, like anything, boils down to action and reaction, cause and effect. It preys on fear, on hope. It's a tool, nothing more, used by the weak to control the strong. Or at least they try. Ernest, even in the simplicity you adore, there's a complexity to the human spirit that you're glossing over. It's the soul of a man, his place, his land, his heritage, that propaganda seeks to sever. Without roots, a man floats, and in that floating, they control him. Our souls, our roots, there's an inherent tension in how we hold on to these amidst the barrage of conditioning. It shapes norms, yes, but at what cost to our individuality, our very humanity? The cost is steep. Look around, it's all for sale. Dreams, ideals, love. They're packaged, marketed, and fed back to us until we can't tell the difference between what's real and what's been sold to us. Aye, and in that selling, they snatch the pen from our hands, leaving us to live out stories we had no hand in writing. We become echoes of someone else's narrative, a pale imitation of life. And yet, we're talking about it, aren't we? In discussing this very mechanism, we find a sort of liberation, a momentary wrenching free from the chains of our conditioning. Talking's well and good, Marcel, but it's the living that counts. You beat propaganda not by chatting, but by living truthfully without compromise. Truth, a word so often bent and twisted by those looking to shape the world in their image. And yet, it's all any man really has. His truth, his land, his story. That's where the fight against this conditioning begins. Indeed, the struggle is eternal, and literature remains our beacon, guiding us through the fog of manipulation. As we wield our pens, let us remember they are both sword and shield against the creeping vines of propaganda and conditioning. The pursuit of happiness, this is where our discourse leads us now. Aldous Huxley in Brave New World posits happiness as a state manufactured and dispensed as easily as a drug, soma. But what truth is there in happiness that knows not the touch of sadness? Ernest, your take. Happiness, it's a ruse in Huxley's world, a way to keep the masses docile. Authentic happiness, that's not something you can distill into a pill. It's the result of struggle, of facing life's relentless truths head on. There's a dignity in that struggle missing in the soma-induced stupor. Ernest, I find your notion romantic but overly simplistic. Yes, authentic experiences matter, but the escapism Huxley speaks of, it's not so different from the whiskey bottle's role in my Yuknapatawpha County. People flee from reality, from their pains, through any means. Does the method matter so much? Both of you speak of authenticity and escapism. Yet isn't the true tragedy in Huxley's vision the obliteration of memory, of desire, that Soma represents? Without these, can one ever truly encounter happiness? It becomes a barren landscape, void of the peaks and valleys that give life its texture. 
Marcel, that's it exactly. Happiness in Huxley's world is shallow, an echo of true happiness. It's like Gatsby's pursuit of Daisy. It's the idea of happiness that drives him, not the authenticity of the emotion. The tragedy lies in the pursuit itself, the perpetual unfulfillment. All of you dance around the notion without piercing its heart. Happiness, friends, is a construct, yes. But importantly, it is one's consciousness, the acute awareness of being, that molds it. What Huxley presents is not happiness, it's sedation. It's the severing of the individual's connection to the very essence of life, to the stream of consciousness that is our only true access to meaning, to joy, to despair. So if I follow, we're condemning Huxley's Soma not because it offers happiness, but because it offers a counterfeit of happiness that strips life of its substance, robbing humanity of the very experiences that define our existence. Precisely. It's the difference between living and merely existing, between facing the world with all its cruelty, beauty, and complexity, and turning your back on it for a mirage of peace. Yet we must acknowledge this discussion on the authenticity of happiness presupposes one's ability to seek it in anguish and pleasure alike. Huxley's world, with its caste system, already deprives many of this pursuit entirely. Indeed, Faulkner, and what's happiness but a moment's respite from the burden of existence, a fleeting memory that touches us, leaving us yearning for something indefinable. It's the chase, the dream, marred by the crushing reality. The soma, it's just a means to an end, the end being control, the perpetuation of a sterile status quo. And it is through our encounters with life in its rawest form that we understand the true nature of happiness. Huxley's brilliance lies not in his denunciation of happiness, but in his critique of a society that would so thoroughly misunderstand its nature as to attempt its manufacture. Then, in our consensus lies a paradox, that happiness, genuine and profound, necessitates the presence of its opposite, sadness. Huxley's cautionary tale warns us not against the pursuit of happiness, but against the folly of believing it can be rendered without cost, without journey. Let us now turn to the significance of art, literature, and science in a society under the grip of control. James, your thoughts on art holding a mirror to this truth? Art, in its truest essence, transcends the mundane. It confronts, challenges the status quo. In our conditioned society, art becomes the clandestine whisper of rebellion. It isn't just an escape, it's an awakening. The state fears the artist. The artist embodies the chaos they cannot sanction, the questions they cannot suppress. Yet, what tragedy befalls art when it's reduced to mere entertainment, serving the whims of a populace lulled into complacency by soma and spectacles? The great Gatsby, in essence, was a reflection on the mirage of the American dream. What becomes of dreams when society only values art for its ability to distract, not to enlighten? Indeed, Scott, art, particularly literature, holds the unparalleled power of capturing the minutiae of personal experiences, emotions, memories that the world state endeavors to erase. It is through Proustian memory, through the involuntary recall of a taste, a scent, that we resist the homogeneity enforced upon us. Literature sustains the individual against the onslaught of collectivism. Let's not embellish. Literature, art, they're combatants in the ring against tyranny, sure. But let's not forget, they're often the first to be sacrificed at the altar of control. Real art demands discomfort, demands confrontation. It's raw, it's bloody, it's alive. The world state, or any entity striving for control, can't have that. They aim to sanitize, to sterilize. But you can't sterilize the human spirit without killing it. And what of science? In Brave New World, science is but a tool for control rather than exploration. Science, the double-edged sword. Once a path to enlightenment, now a leash. In our quest for understanding, we mustn't forget the ethical morass that comes with playing God. Literature, at its core, serves as a chronicler, a conscience to the scientific endeavors of man. Science, when married to the profit motive or the mechanism of control, loses its nobility. It's Gatsby's green light, forever eluding our grasp in the name of progress. Real progress, I dare say, comes from the soul, from the heart, from our capacity to love and to dream. To reflect, Scott, to reflect deeply about the world around us and within us. Science stripped of ethics is akin to memory stripped of emotion, a barren landscape. 
It is through art that we imbue our scientific pursuit with moral consequence, with a soul. Let science be science and art be art. When they forget their place, when one tries to commandeer the other, that's when you've got trouble. As for significance, significance comes from human action, human suffering, and human achievements not from the cold calculations of science or the indulgent fantasies of art. It would seem, then, that within the context of control, art and literature provide not only a means of escape, but a form of resistance, while science, devoid of ethical consideration, can become a tool for tyranny. The balance between these domains might well determine the fabric of our society or its unraveling. The illusion of freedom within the tightly controlled confines of the world state presents us a chilling parallel to the self-imposed chains we wear. Is freedom merely a state of mind, or is there something more tangible at stake? Freedom's not about the vastness of the sea or the open road. It's in the choice, the ability to face life with all its rawness, its pain, and beauty. The world state offers safety, but at what cost? A life unchallenged, untested, is a life not lived. It's the difference between existing and living. Yet Virginia, think of the Roaring Twenties, my golden era, now faded. We believed in the illusion of freedom too. Freedom to chase dreams, but were they our own or one society sold us? The world state, it's not a leap, it's an echo of our past, merely magnified. It's Gatsby's green light, always just out of reach, promising freedom but offering bondage. Freedom, it seems, in the world state or our own, is tethered to memory, to the authenticity of our desires. What is freedom if not the ability to pursue a true desire, unmanipulated, pure, not the product of some external programming? The tragedy is not in the loss of what we desire, but in the loss of desiring what truly belongs to us. You're all skirting around the notion, dancing with shadows. Real freedom? It's consciousness unfettered by the chains of society's making, by the specter of control. The world state, it is the ultimate usurper of consciousness, making automata of men. We're heading towards that, inch by inch, with every technological advance, every surrender of privacy. The cyclical nature of history is the battleground of freedom and oppression. You speak of consciousness, James, and choice earnest, but let's not forget the roots, the blood-soaked soil from which we sprang. In the American South, freedom's tale is tolling mournfully. We are bound not just by societal chains, but by those we forge with our own hands. It appears then that the world state's most egregious crime is its theft of conflict, of struggle. Without these, humanity is robbed of its essence, the capacity for growth. In avoiding pain, we evade the very essence of freedom. Exactly. Avoiding reality, Willingly blindfolding ourselves to the truths of existence, that's the cowardice the world state peddles. Show me a man who faced life and didn't blink, and I'll show you true freedom. But don't we all long for a bit of that illusion? The belief that tomorrow we could be anything, go anywhere. Yet here we are, debating freedoms in a world marching towards uniformity, towards safety that suffocates. Sometimes I wonder if we wouldn't all swallow Soma, given half the chance. And yet, Scott, it is in the nuances, in the delicate fabrics of memory and desire, that we find our true escape, not in the seductive simplicity of Soma. Our freedom lies not in the evasion of life's complexities, but in our immersion in them. Immersion, yes, but let's not romanticize the struggle unduly. The battle for consciousness is fought in the quiet corners of our minds, in the resistance against the tidal wave of external influence. In crafting our narrative, our identity, lies our rebellion. Rebellion, then, becomes our most sincere expression of freedom. In the face of societies that would dictate our desires, our thoughts, our very selves, rebellion is not just choice, but duty. We're now steering into the digital and biotechnological age, its reflection in Huxley's vision. Marcel, your contemplation on memory's erosion in this era? Technology intrudes upon our quiet moments those precious instants where true memory and self are found. In Proustian terms, the screen light drowns out the glow of the Madeleine. Our experiences are curated, less our own. Huxley foresaw this, a world stripped of genuine connection, leaving us strangers to our souls. Exactly. It's as if our consciousness is being outsourced to machines. 
We're crafting a narrative of our lives on social platforms that's more fictitious than any novel. Huxley's world, artificial to its core, mirrors our digital facades. We're losing our grip on what's authentically human. And the divide. The divide grows wider, the chasm between the manicured lives we see on screens and the tangible, flawed existence we live. Huxley might not have mentioned Instagram, but Soma isn't too far off from the numbing scroll of the newsfeed, the like button our modern panacea for discontent. It's cowardice. You're all dressing it up fancy, but it's just running away. Huxley knew it. A man's gotta face life, not hide behind screens or in the false cheer of some pill. We're becoming slaves to comfort, afraid of a little discomfort. The digital era, like the world state, perpetuates age-old prejudices, only with more subtlety. We're led to believe we're advancing, yet we're entrenched deeper in old biases. Huxley's caste system is reimagined online, where algorithms decide who gets heard, shaping our perceptions, reinforcing our seclusions. Indeed, the very fabric of our individuality is under threat. We trade privacy for convenience, a bargain Huxley might have grimaced at, yet predicted. Our identities, once complex, are becoming as one-dimensional as our profile pictures. It's a grotesque parody of connection, this digital age. True remembrance, love, the essence of our being, cannot be compressed into bytes and pixels. Our struggle isn't with technology itself, but with how it's reshaping the narrative of human experience into something sterile, something Huxley warned us about. We must awaken from this digital soma, reclaim the narrative. Yet there's a tragic beauty in our plight, reminiscent of Gatsby's green light, ever reaching, ever failing to grasp what's real and true beyond the shimmering surface. And what's real is what's in front of you, the tangible world, unmediated by screens. There's no substitute for the rawness of living, the blood, sweat, and tears of existence. That's where freedom lies, not in some algorithm's shadow. Our journey through this digitized era, then, requires vigilance to preserve our inner worlds, to resist the seduction of a superficially connected life, and to embrace the discomforts that make life deeply human. Huxley's dystopia becomes not a prediction, but a cautionary tale for our times. As we grapple with these digital chains, our literature, our art, reminds us of our humanity, our rich inner lives, and the strength we possess to overcome these modern trials. Huxley's narrative is but a chapter in our ongoing story of resilience. Let's delve into how Aldous Huxley's personal disillusions and the broader societal anxieties of his time are reflected in Brave New World. Huxley, living in the shadows of World War I and the beginnings of rapid technological advancement, presents a dystopia that's as much a reflection of his inner turmoil as it is a critique of the society's trajectory. James, your narrative style often explores the inner workings of the psyche. How do you see Huxley's personal experiences influencing his narrative? In the labyrinth of Huxley's Brave New World, there's a palpable tension between the desire for stability and the chaos of human emotion. Much like wandering through Dublin's streets in Ulysses, navigating the layers of consciousness, Huxley traverses the dystopian landscape of the world state. It's his disillusionment, not just with the war, but with the arid sterility of modern life that seeps through the fabric of his narrative. The narrative is a stream, a flowing consciousness beset by the rocks of rapid societal change and the whirlpools of personal despair. Ah, but you see, it's not just the societal shifts, James. It's Huxley's acute awareness of time's relentless march much like in my work, where memory and desire interlace. Huxley externalizes his internal disquietude through the meticulous control over human biology and psychology. His narrative is steeped in the loss of the past, the manipulation of memory and desire, themes I find myself returning to time and again. You're both dancing around it. Huxley saw the bloody mess of the World War, the disgrace it was. He saw society scrambling for a sense of order, for anything that could be painted as progress. But what did that get us? A world afraid of feeling, of true human connection. He translated that fear, that loss, into a world that's lost its backbone, its capacity to face life raw and unfiltered. No embellishments needed. It's all there in stark, stripped prose. The Great War left us questioning the very nature of our society, our values. Huxley, much like Gatsby, reaching out to that green light, 
reaches into the future to caution us. But where my Gatsby tragically clings to his idealized past, Huxley propels himself forward, dissecting the future with prescient clarity. He sees the Jazz Age's disillusionment, its moral bankruptcy, and projects it onto a society numbed by soma, devoid of purpose. It's a bleak, unvarnished critique, delivered with the sharpness of a scalpel. No, a sledgehammer. But don't undersell the impact of history and personal grief on Huxley's vision. Our experiences, especially those bound up in the soil of our homeland, in the blood spilt across it, they seep into our narrative. Huxley's England post-World War, it's not just a backdrop, it's a character, a ghost haunting brave new world. He, like us, is trying to make sense of a world that seems to have lost its compass in the fog of progress for progress's sake. And so Huxley navigates the ruins of post-war disillusionment, his narrative a vessel for societal critique rooted in personal desolation. His foresighted vision of dystopia is as much an inheritance of his time as it is a warning for ours. His characters, trapped in a meticulously engineered society, reflect his and, by extension, our anguish in the face of unrelenting progress that threatens to unmoor humanity from its essence. We've traversed the expanse of Huxley's vision, dissecting its relevance from technological servitude to the manipulation of human essence. Let us now converge on our final thoughts. James, your perspective? It's the cyclical nature of control, isn't it? Just as in Ulysses, where we navigate the consciousness, Huxley traverses dystopian control. Yet what strikes me is not merely the narrative's foresight, but the human spirit's resilience against conformity. To live is to struggle against the tides of societal constraints, a truth as evident in our discussions as in my stream of consciousness. Yet, James, your optimism seems almost quixotic in the face of Huxley's precision. For me, Brave New World reflects the fragility of memory against the omnipotence of technological governance. It speaks to the essence of our being, how our very desires and memories can be engineered to oblivion. This, I fear, is not a resilience, but a descent into the abyss of forgetfulness. We risk becoming shadows of ourselves, bereft of the authenticity that shapes our very existence. You both circle around the point. The real punch is not just the loss or resilience of humanity. It's about the steel in a man's spine. Brave New World isn't a warning about technology or control. It's a testament to the fight left in a man when everything's said and done. The world always tries to emasculate you, to make you soft. But the essence, our essence, is how we face that, stripped down, without the fluff. That's where Huxley hits home. Ernest, your romanticism of stoicism seems a tad oversimplified. Huxley's narrative is elaborate in its portrayal of societal despair, mirroring the disillusionment weaved through the great Gatsby. It's the grandeur of dreams versus the crushing reality of societal expectations. Our relevance as artists, as visionaries, is predicated on our ability to illuminate these very discrepancies. Huxley, in his genius, crafts a mirror to society's facade, unmasking the grotesque underbelly of what happens when dreams are not just deferred, but obliterated. All well and good, Scott, but each of you dances around the fire without getting burnt. Huxley's world, like the Yoknapatawpha County I've concocted, is about the human spirit's indomitable will amid constructs designed to crush it. Yet, unlike my South, replete with its decay and resilience, Huxley's vision lacks the soil, both literal and metaphorical, that allows for rebirth amidst ruin. What terrifies is not the precision of control, but the vacuum it creates, sucking dry the marrow of human complexity, leaving behind a husk of existence. A rich tapestry of insights, Yet the thread I find most compelling amidst our discourse is the equilibrium between the advancement of society and the preservation of the human soul. Brave New World Through Our Eyes morphs from mere narrative to a crucible testing the bounds of human integrity against the leviathan of progress. We've unearthed the multifaceted dialogue between individuality and the collective, the nature of freedom, and the essence of resistance. Our literature, our very beings, serve not just as echoes, but as clarions against the encroaching silence Huxley envisions.